Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guests today are Bridget Crawford, James D. Hopkins Professor of Law at Pace University School of Law, and Emily Gold Waldman, Professor of Law and Associate Dean for Faculty Development and Strategic Planning at Pace University School of Law. Today, we will discuss their article, The Unconstitutional Tampon Tax, which will appear in the University of Richmond Law Review. So uh, welcome, Bridget and Emily. Thank you. We're Thanks. happy to be here. Yeah, great. I'm really happy to have you on. I really enjoyed reading your paper um, on a topic which, honestly, I had vaguely heard of but didn't really know anything about and um, really learned a lot from from reading it. And I was wondering if you could start out, uh, for those of our listeners who might not be familiar with this problem, just by explaining what exactly is a tampon tax? So uh, this is Bridget. What we are talking about is the sales tax that uh, customers pay when they buy tampons, sanitary pads, uh, menstrual cups, or related products. So just like when you go to the corner store uh, to buy, for example, a notebook or a pencil, you'd expect to pay sales tax. And, and that rate depends on what state you're in. Every state sets their own tax rate. And it just so happens um, that included in the group of things that are taxable are uh, menstrual hygiene products, tampons, pads, and the like. And that's a very curious thing, given that uh, similar items, although we can't really say that they're the same items, similar items like condoms or Rogaine or erectile dysfunction drugs are free from tax. So we got to thinking, why is it that these tampons and pads uh, are subject to tax. There are some very funny things that escape taxation um, in some jurisdictions. In Georgia, for example, tattoos and piercings aren't subject to taxation. In Idaho, you can buy a chainsaw without paying tax, but boy, you're going to pay tax on your tampons. And so we were interested in, in looking at that question just as a matter of fairness, uh, but then also from the perspective of constitutional law. Okay, yeah. so, sorry, Emily? I was going to say we really got interested in thinking about whether there was some legal basis on which that could be challenged. In addition, of course, there are public policy arguments for why that doesn't seem right, but we were interested in also thinking about the legal arguments for why it's problematic, and that was really the focus of our article, was the constitutional arguments against this. Right. So maybe you could say a little something more about sales tax policy and sort of how that's sort of fashioned, <laughs> as it were, at the state law level. I mean, why are some things subject to sales tax and other things not subject to sales tax? And is is there any rationale for including or not including different kinds of products? Like, I guess the euphemism we could use here would be like feminine hygiene products. So basically, each state gets to decide for itself whether to have a sales tax or not. And then if they decide to have a sales tax, the states get to decide what items are going to be taxable and what items are not. Generally speaking, the sale of all tangible property, all the stuff you can touch, uh, pens, pencils, things like that, are going to be subject to taxation, the sales tax, unless they are specifically exempt from taxation. So to be exempt, you have to get um, legislators in a room and decide what items are going to be exempt from taxation. And as we looked at the items, we generally saw a breakdown between so-called necessities, for lack of a better word, and things that are considered luxuries. So things that would be considered necessities uh, like medicine or uh, clothing, for example, in some states is, is not subject to taxation. But then things uh, like soda or lip balm or lipstick, those are considered luxuries. And so those get subject to taxation. And so our, our curiosity was peaked even further. How is it that tampons are considered luxuries, but Band-Aids, for example, are not considered luxuries. 
Right, right. Is this distinction between necessities and luxuries sort of an explicit one that legislators use when they're deciding whether or not to impose or I guess not impose tax on a particular category of objects? Or is it like a a category, like an analytic category that scholars of tax policy use to distinguish between different taxes um, and, you know, why certain items would be taxed or not. I'm kind of wondering what, what the sort of, wh- where is that distinction coming from? The distinction is definitely one that's uh, coming from the brains of people who think about taxation, not the people who are writing the laws. Although the laws sometimes are written in terms of medical uh, uh, expenditures or m- items necessary for medical expenses not being subject to taxation. And then the the specific state legislature will typically go on to describe what they mean by um, medical expenditures. But um, obviously, uh, menstruating is something women do every month. There's, there's no medical issue. It's just simply normal. So um, even in states that define medical items or medical uh, products as exempt from taxation wouldn't necessarily mean that menstrual hygiene products would be exempt from taxation. Right. Okay. So in your in your paper, you 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 point out the kind of weird incoherence of a lot of the distinction between which items are subject to sales tax and which ones aren't. I mean, I found some of the examples quite amusing, like you mentioned chainsaws and whatnot. I mean, I imagine that could be a necessity in Idaho. I don't know, but it does seem like an odd thing to exempt from, from sales tax. But, but more specifically, you drill down on some particular products that distinguish the way the state sales taxes treat men and women differently. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that distinction to sort of highlight the actual legislative choices that states are making. Yeah. And the reason that this is Emily, the reason that we did that in the article is we really, for there to be a constitutional problem with this is there needs to be some sort of equal protection issue, right? If it were just completely random, what gets exempted and what doesn't, and there was no rhyme or reason to it, it would be hard to suddenly say that you have to exempt tampons. But what we really looked at was when you see roughly analogous products that are used by men getting this more favorable treatment where they're exempted, you know, essentially treated as necessities to the extent that that's sort of the dominant theme for what gets exempted. So when you see that happening for roughly analogous products for men, but then not happening for the product that's really the most associated with female biology, you know, menstrual hygiene products. That's where we started seeing the hook for an equal protection argument. So that's why we really focused on that issue, right? Trying to see this as menstrual hygiene products almost being a proxy for female sex to the extent that if they're being treated worse, then other products that are equally necessary, you can start to see that it's it starts to look like disfavorable treatment of women. Right. So, I mean, the unfairness seems kind of palpable on its face, right? Um, and, and so I could see why people would immediately, or I, I can see why it might be a kind of a prima facie constitutional concern. But I was wondering, could, could you walk through the actual kind of constitutional analysis you did in the paper? Because I think there were some technical elements to it that might not be familiar to kind of non-constitutional lawyer listeners. It might be helpful for them to understand sort of, sort of how the argument actually runs. Yeah, that's a great question. So basically, with equal protection law, um, there are certain personal characteristics, right, where if the government is classifying on the basis of those characteristics, it triggers heightened scrutiny by the courts, right? So outside of this example for a minute, if the government is in any way facially classifying based on race or national origin, and that gets challenged, a court is going to apply what's called strict scrutiny. Right. So they're going to look at whether that classification is necessary to achieve a compelling government purpose. And unless it is, they're going to strike it down. When it comes to sex or gender based classifications, courts apply what's called intermediate scrutiny. So if you have a law that is facially classifying based on sex, 
it's going to trigger intermediate scrutiny, which means that a court will look at whether it's substantially related to an important governmental purpose. The tricky thing is this. If the law is not facially classifying on the basis of sex, right? So it's facially classifying on some other thing, but it's just having a disparate impact based on sex. The Supreme Court has said it's not going to apply intermediate scrutiny. Hmm. It's only going to apply a much lower level of review called rational basis, in which all that has to be shown is that the classification is rationally related to some sort of legitimate governmental purpose. The only way that a court will go back to intermediate scrutiny when it's a facially neutral law is if it can be shown that there was some sort of discriminatory intent behind the law. So a big case on this is a case called Feeney, which involves from the 70s. Um, Massachusetts had a law that favored veterans for civil service positions, and that had a really disparate impact on women because most veterans were men. But the Supreme Court said, you know what? It's not facially classifying based on sex. It's facially classifying based on whether you're a veteran. Even though it's having a disparate impact based on sex, it can't be shown that this was done to hurt women. So we're only going to apply rational basis review. So the thing that we really started thinking about was, what's the best way to think about a tampon tax? Should it be seen as a facial classification based on sex, in which case you can get intermediate scrutiny? Or does it have to be seen as neutral on the basis of sex, in which case we're probably stuck with rational basis review unless we can show intent? So a big piece of our article is trying to say that this is actually close enough to a facial classification based on sex that we should get to intermediate scrutiny. And why do we say that? Because menstrual hygiene products, more than almost anything else, even like veteran status, right, are is so closely linked to being a woman right? Only women menstruate, right? It's not something that is a choice, even if, you know, separating it from some other things like pregnancy and things like that. This is something that is just a biological fact. Women do menstruate, right? These products are a necessity. It's something that for most women starts when they're, let's say, 12 to 14. It continues until they're 50. It's sort of a fact of women's life. It is so inextricably linked to being a woman, that treating menstrual hygiene products differently than other necessities, we argue, can be seen as basically a proxy for sex discrimination and that therefore a court should apply intermediate scrutiny. What's more, we say, even if you don't buy that, even if you think, no, it's just neutral, it's just about what things get taxed, we do think there's an argument that here there is sufficient intent, discriminatory intent, that you can get back to intermediate scrutiny because at this, it's, it's completely understood that this is a product for women. We think that the failure to sort of single them out as exempt from the sales tax is linked to a sort of animus and discomfort and squeamishness about menstruation and not wanting to discuss it. So we think right. your path gets you to intermediate scrutiny. Okay. Okay. So I, I guess, do, do you think that legislatures are imposing sales taxes on feminine hygiene products or rather maybe failing to exempt uh, feminine hygiene products from sales taxes because they specifically want to burden women or is there something else going on? And for the constitutionalists, does it, does it matter? Well, it matters. Okay. So if, if you buy our argument that, treating menstrual hygiene products worse can be seen as just just essentially sex discrimination, then in a sense, the intent doesn't matter if it's seen as a facial classification based on sex. The intent matters if you don't buy that and you say, well, no, it's just facially classifying based on products, it has nothing to do with sex. That's when you need to show intent. Even there, though, I'm not convinced that you have to show that they really want to hurt women versus there's an animus toward, there's a discomfort, there's a squeamishness toward discussing these products and taking the steps to sort of affirmatively name them and say they're not taxed. And I think that's more than just, even, even if it's not intent to harm, it's still a sort of animus that we think should be sufficient. I guess that's what I would say. 
Right. Okay. So just, just to push a little further on the, on the constitutional analysis, you distinguish between sort of what that would look like in the case of applying intermediate scrutiny mm -hmm. and what that would look like in the case of applying the rational basis test, which historically has kind of been famously toothless, although it seems like at least in some contexts, it's doing a little bit more work in recent years exactly. than it used That's to. That's true. So even under rational basis, we think there is a plausible argument for striking it down. But you're right. It's much more deferential than intermediate scrutiny. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about sort of what conclusions you would have to reach in order to find the imposition of sales taxes on, on feminine hygiene products unconstitutional under the intermediate scrutiny test as compared to what you would have to find in order to find it unconstitutional under the rational basis test or sort of depending on how you think about the rational basis test today, I guess. Okay. So if you agree <clears throat> that intermediate scrutiny should be applied, right, either because this is close enough to a facial classification based on sex or because you think there's enough of an animus toward feminine hygiene products um, that it can be seen as disparate impact plus intent. So if you're in intermediate scrutiny world, then you would have to show that treating menstrual hygiene products worse than other analogous necessities is substantially related to an important governmental purpose. That would be really hard to show. I think once you're in intermediate scrutiny, that's most of the battle. Um, because it's hard to see what <coughs> important governmental purpose there is for treating these products worse than other necessities. It would be one thing if nothing ever got an exemption, ever, mm -hmm. right? But here, there are already all sorts of exemptions being given out, including, um, as Bridget mentioned, even for some things that are plainly not necessities, right? Like tattoos, so once you're in intermediate scrutiny world, it's actually, I think, a pretty easy argument. The challenge is getting to intermediate scrutiny world, but especially because if you look at the most recent really big intermediate scrutiny case, um, which is from the BMI case back in the 90s, um, Justice Ginsburg wrote that opinion and she said to pass intermediate scrutiny, you really need to make sure that what's going on right, is not limiting women, limiting their economic opportunities, limiting their professional opportunities. And of course, making it harder to buy menstrual hygiene products is doing just that. Mm. With a rational basis, um, it's tougher because as you said, rational basis review is usually more deferential. But even in rational basis world, occasionally things do get struck down for lacking even a rational relationship to a legitimate governmental objective. And here you would have to buy the argument, I think, that first of all, again, there's some sort of animus or squeamishness going on about menstrual hygiene products that means that they're not being thought about rationally here. There's really no reason that things like band-aids and condoms should be getting this treatment, but not menstrual hygiene products, right? So you would have to buy that there's something irrational going on, and there really is no legitimate reason for continuing to tax those products when you exempt other analogous necessities. Okay, so you, you, you mentioned something... Uh, in this in, the, in your last answer that I thought was interesting, would it be constitutionally acceptable for the um, for the government to just not uh, exempt anything? I mean, my understanding is a lot of tax scholars don't really like sales tax exemptions in in the first place. So, would that be an approach that governments, state governments, could take to avoid this potential unconstitutionality? And and are there reasons why that would be a less preferable? Yeah, well, I think than exempting. Maybe we'll both take a crack at that. Constitutionally, yes, I think that would be fine. There's nothing that says there has to be sales tax exemptions in the Constitution, right? If they want to tax everything, yeah, that would avoid the constitutional problem. It would raise other policy questions that I'll let Bridget talk about. But yeah, our argument isn't that even if everything in the world is taxed, you need to exempt menstrual hygiene products. Rather, our argument is once you're exempting things that roughly track this distinction between necessities and luxuries, to fail to then include the one thing that's a necessity just for women, that's what starts to look fishy from a constitutional perspective. Um, but I'll let Bridget talk about the policy reasons why it's probably unlikely that states would just stop exempting 
all prep, anything at all. Well, so sales tax revenue is a huge, huge contributor to state budgets. And the, most states raise more money through sales tax than they do through income tax. There are some exceptions to that, of course, jurisdictions like Alaska and Delaware, uh, chief among them. But sales tax is a huge moneymaker for the states. It's a way the states keep operating. And tax scholars don't like um, sales tax exemptions because they chip away at the sales tax base. They erode the sales tax base. What does that mean? It means it takes things out of the basket of taxation and gives the state less to tax. And that's certainly no way to implement a coherent tax policy. But once you start putting some things in and out of the basket, you most certainly cannot uh, include in the basket things that are so closely tied to women's biology um, so as to have this discriminatory impact on women. Right. Okay. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the sort of actual tangible impact on women that these tampon taxes have. I mean, how large is the burden? And from a constitutional standpoint, does it matter how large the burden burden is? From a constitutional standpoint, I would say no, it doesn't really matter. Um, once you're talking about something that can really be quantified, and as Bridget will go into, this is something that can be quantified. And over the course of a woman's life, it does amount to real money. So we're certainly over any sort of threshold of, oh, it's so tiny and de minimis that nobody would ever think about it. Um, once you're over that burden, then constitutionality, then constitutionally, it matters whether it's, you know, hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, it's still a burden and it matters. So we've done some, some back of the envelope estimates and uh, consulted other people's estimates, and we've uh, read low estimates of seven hundred dollars and change uh, for a, a lifetime, just in the taxes, not on um, uh, not on the materials. The sorry, seven hundred dollars to two thousand dollars on the menstrual hygiene products alone, um, not just the taxes. So if you added tax uh, to that it does end up being uh, quite a bit of money. So, um, you know, whether that's hundreds or thousands of dollars, this is real money. And and that matters to women. Uh, it matters to women of all income levels. Obviously, one thing that tax scholars talk about is tax regressivity, the notion that tax burdens uh, hurt more for people who have less income and a rich woman or those who love rich women are, are going to um, uh, feel that bite a little less sharply than someone who is living paycheck to paycheck or who is homeless. But those that's real money and, and real money matters. Yeah. I mean, it seems like it's especially a burden for low income people, which from a sales tax perspective, seems like something that ought to be salient to the people who are deciding what to tax and what not to tax. I mean, at, le at least it's my understanding that a lot of these sales tax exemptions go to things that we want to make sure that low income people are able to buy at the lowest price possible, like food and other kinds of things that people can't live without. And it certainly seems odd to exempt something that 50% of the public of the population needs to use every month. Exactly. And this is something, I mean, we talk about this in the article. I mean, we want for every reason society should want girls and women to be able to access these products, right? It enables them to leave their homes, go to work, go to school. It's not it, as a public health issue, you don't want people not using these products when they're menstruating, right? This is what's like stanching the blood flow. So for every reason, we want everyone to be able to use these products as a society. And so that's why there's an important public policy aspect to this, to making them as accessible as possible. Right. So you note in your paper that there's sort of an ongoing litigation history around the constitutionality of the imposition of sales taxes on uh, menstrual uh, hygiene products. I was wondering if you talk a little bit about that and what, how kind of how legislatures, state legislatures, have been reacting to this 
kind of simultaneous uh, constitutional litigation and sort of public policy argumentation? So we are aware of four cases, uh, New York, Florida, Ohio, and California. Uh, New York and Florida both uh, repealed their tampon tax before the cases uh, went to trial. So I think that certainly um, those legislatures may have been considering repeal before the litigation, but the litigation most certainly hastened the repeal. The California um, case was dismissed. Uh, the Ohio case is still proceeding. Obviously, uh, the easiest way to effectuate this change would be through um, legislative repeal. The, this is an issue that has bipartisan support in many, many states, uh, Texas being an example where both Republicans and Democrats are joining together this legislative session to consider repeal of the tampon tax. But in the absence of um, of legislative action, uh, there will most certainly be additional lawsuits filed. And part of uh, what Emily and I really sought to do in our article was lay a roadmap for the constitutional arguments that the plaintiffs could advance. Right. That's, yeah. Okay, cool. And I, it's reading the paper, I mean, it, it struck me that there is a real substantive burden and substantive wrong, but I don't know if I was reading between the lines, but it, it felt like there was kind of a symbolic harm as well. Am I right to, to, to get that impression? I think that's right. That's another thing that we were thinking about is the message that's sent by what gets exempted as something that, you know, government doesn't want to tax you for, that government, you know, either considers a very valuable Thing for you to be doing, a very important thing for you to be doing. I was thinking about it in terms of this isn't exactly the same, but to the extent that you're seeing more and more places um, as a way of trying to make women feel valued and welcomed, right? They'll put free menstrual hygiene products in their bathrooms. Um, I remember shortly after I graduated from Harvard Law School, there was a new dean, Elena Kagan, now on the Supreme Court. But when she became the dean of Harvard Law School, one thing she did as sort of a tangible message to women was she made sure that there were free tampons and other menstrual hygiene products in all the women's restrooms at the law school, right? And so things like, I think there is a symbolic aspect to this of recognizing, you know, this isn't something that's sort of to gross and shouldn't be talked about, but it's actually something that's part of being a woman, a woman and the idea of government actually recognizing that and saying, and yeah, we're not going to tax this because we recognize this is a necessity. And if we're exempting other things, we should too. I do think that has a valuable symbolic effect. Great. Yeah. No, I, that, I, I couldn't agree more. And I was wondering sort of as we wrap up the conversation, if you could kind of maybe frame the paper and the concerns that you're expressing in the paper in relation to broader concerns about about women's rights and constitutional litigation around around women's rights in general because i i felt like that was in the background of a lot of the paper and in, in particular you know cases like feeney do you think the court would reach the same kind of conclusions today well let's um let's think briefly about how this paper uh, fits into the general cultural conversations about women and women's advancement in society. There is no doubt that the internet has completely changed the way that women and uh, others are able to communicate across platforms. And that's true of every interest group, of every political dimension, et cetera, et cetera. But part of what is so powerful about the tampon tax uh, movement, uh, uh, Me Too, Time's Up, all sorts of different movements is the ability to identify people who are like you, who are interested in the same things you are, and the ability to get your message across. And taxation, I think, is an especially important lens for analyzing inequality. It's quantifiable, and it, it's something we all recognize. Anyone who's ever bought a tampon for themselves or for someone that they care about, a sister, a girlfriend, a, a roommate, knows what a tampon tax is. We can see it and we can see that it costs money. And it's when, when that type of injustice is brought to the forefront 
people recognize it and they don't want to tolerate it. In terms of thinking about Feeney, um, that's an interesting question as to whether that would um, also be uh, decided the same way today. I mean, I have to say, honestly, with the current um, makeup of the Supreme Court, I cannot really predict that right now they're going to um, change that, right? That's sort of an embedded aspect of equal protection doctrine right now. This idea that when something really is facially neutral, you need to look for a discriminatory intent. That being said, there have been some recent cases in other contexts, like, for example, the marriage equality cases, where the Supreme Court has been kind of integrating and braiding together a little bit more. These two lines of analysis, you know, a facial classification versus facial neutrality. So I think the court may, it, things may evolve over time. I don't see Feeney getting overturned overnight, but I think maybe that really sharp distinction, that sharp divide between facial classification, facial neutrality may start to go away. But I don't even think you need to have that happen for things like the tampon tax to be held unconstitutional. I actually think there's an even stronger case there, right? Because with Feeney, it was about veterans. Well, over time, right, they're very well, there are going to be more women in the armed forces. Veteran is not inherently um, a proxy for male sex in the same way that tampons and menstrual hygiene products are probably always going to be somewhat of a proxy for female sex. So in a sense, it's an easier case. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. You too. Thanks for having us. Miss Catherine Hepburn. We know the music. We sing the words. Sometimes I wonder, though, do we really listen? Do we feel the sense of the words? My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. Of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died. Land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside. Let freedom ring. You know the other verses. Their meaning is precious to all of us. The Armed Forces Bicentennial Caravan tells of America's stirring national music and the history of our nation's fight for freedom. I suggest that you pay it a visit.